feel nauseous, believe me Never had a lot of sh** come easy Had to work hard, struggle just to be me Had to rise up just so they could see me Did what I had to do just to feed me And what was left over I put towards You will hear a conversation between a woman and the librarian Now you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6 Now, listen to the talk and answer the questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to join the library. We're new to the district, you see. Hmm, certainly. Well, all we need is some sort of identification with your name and address on it. Oh, dear. We just moved, you see, and everything has my old address. A uh, driving license, perhaps? No, I don't drive. No, your husband's would do. Yes, but his license will still have the old address on it. Hmm, perhaps you have a letter addressed to you at your new house. No, I'm afraid not. We've only been there a few days, you see, and no one's written to us yet. Well, what about your bank book? That's just the same. Oh dear, and I I did want to get some books out this weekend. We're going on holiday to relax after the move, you see, and I wanted to take something with me to read. Well, I'm sorry, but we can't possibly issue tickets without some form of identification. What about your passport? What? Oh, yes, how silly of me. I've just got a new one, and it does have our new address. I've just been to book our air ticket, so I have it on me. Ah, oh, well, that's all right. Your ticket will be ready soon. OK. Um, how many books am I allowed to take out? You can take four books out at a time, and you can also get two tickets to take out three magazines or periodicals. Newspapers, I'm afraid, can't be taken out. Oh, that's fine. Uh, do you have a record library? Some libraries do, I know. Yes, we do. You have to pay a deposit of $5 in case you damage them. But that entitles you to take out two records at a time. That's good. Could you show me where your history and biography sections are, please? Yes, just over there to your right. If there's any particular book you want, you can look it up in the catalogue, which you'll find just around the corner. You can also find a touchscreen information service on level two. Thank you. Oh, and how long am I allowed to keep the books for? Well, the normal loan period is three weeks, with two weeks extension. Oh dear. We're going away for four weeks. Can I renew them now? Mm, I'm afraid not. You must do that at the end of three weeks. I see. Thank you very much. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the talk and answer the questions 7 to 10. Well, let's go into some details. Your name, please, madam. My name is Barbara. The surname is Cooper. It's spelt as C-O-O-P-E-R. Fine. And what's your contact number? If we have new books coming, we can contact you in time. Good. You can call me on 723-6518. But it's better after 5 p.m. You know I have to work during the daytime. Do you need the office number? I don't think so. It's enough. Could you tell me the address? I lived in King Road, but of course you need my new address. Um, it's 25 St. Mary Road, Hanwell. That's H-A-N-W-E-L-L. -L. Is that right? Yes. Do you need the passport number? I just brought it with me. Here you are. Yes, thank you. The number of your passport is G5798-0942. OK, and your ticket is ready. The number is M930123. Thank you. 
Could I take a look around and check out some books? Of course, as you like. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages. And I've got a number of facts, tips and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly 10,000 years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter or cheaper to produce. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type light beer contains no more than 2% alcohol, and the highest may reach 6%. Other drinks such as wine are more alcoholic. Wine contains 8 to 20% alcohol. But that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. As with all foods, 
The more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing. Pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption. And the colour of a bottle can influence the flavour. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavour. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britain even on the list of big consumers, actually the Czech Republic consumes the most beer, at 156 litres per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, what was it like in your school then, Lynn? Well, South African schools are very different from schools in Australia. For a start, children don't start their schooling until they are seven, quite a bit later than schools in Australia. What about New Zealand, Gail? We're more like Australia. I can't believe children don't go to school until they are seven. When do the parents get any free time? Well, there's still the availability of kindergartens or play schools. It's just that formal education doesn't start until later. I don't think it's such a good idea for children to have to be too academic at such a young age. They should be able to just enjoy themselves. Well, yeah, but the first school children go to isn't really very academic. It's just an opportunity for children to learn a few basic social skills by playing and learning with other children. Yes, I'd agree with that. I guess being so close, Australian and New Zealand schools must be similar then. Well, I suppose they do share a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. For example, children in New Zealand go through intermediate school, but in Australia there's only high school. That's right, isn't it, Pat? Yeah, I think so. What about South Africa, Lynn? Do you have an intermediate or high school? Oh, high school. And now the difference between Australian and New Zealand education is that although both countries have state schools and private schools, our private schools are very often run by religious groups, whereas New Zealand schools are secular. That's not true. There are quite a few religious schools in New Zealand. Oh, OK. Maybe we are similar. Only a few South African schools have any religious connection, so I guess we're different. Most people go to state schools. Pat, is it true that some people from your country don't have to go to school at all? Well, that's partly true. Because of the geography of Australia, there are a lot of children who do not have access to schools, at least on a regular basis. Instead, they have a form of correspondence education, where the lessons are actually on the radio and the students send their work in by post. That way they get a lot of what they would if they were in the classroom, apart from the interaction. In New Zealand, not all students have to go to school either. Some parents have opted for homeschooling. Oh, is that like correspondence teaching? We don't really have that. Well, we do have correspondence schools, but homeschooling is different. With homeschooling, the parents teach the children and set them homework. They have to present a syllabus to their local education authority before they can do that, but it is becoming a more popular choice for some parents. I suppose it also suits parents' own commitments. 
I mean, they don't have to worry about collecting their children from school, and they can always teach over the weekend or in the evening if they want to. Is the school day normally quite long then? Not in New Zealand, but I think it can be in Australia. Yeah, that's right. I think Australia is unusual in that there are extracurricular activities which you have to go to. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. These are normally sport activities, but there are a few other options. We have activities after school for any student that is interested, but they aren't compulsory. What about in New Zealand, Gail? I had to do some sport every week. I didn't really like it, but it was part of the school day, so I guess that's not so bad. Anyway, I spent two years at boarding school, so things were a little different. Boarding school? What was that like? Well, the thing I remember most about it was the strict dress code. There were restrictions on everything. You had to wear a school uniform almost all of the time, and it had to be cleaned and ironed. The length of your skirt had to be no less than one inch above your knees when kneeling down. Sometimes we used to go out on school trips or just at weekends with a few friends, but whenever we were outside the school, we had to wear a hat. There was one teacher who always used to give me extra homework because my socks weren't pulled up, and that was in the school late in the evening. I suppose it wasn't that bad, but at the time it felt like a prison. I kept getting into trouble for something. Most of the time I forgot something, normally my school badge. We had to wear that all the time, in the school and out, because it had our house colours on it. Wow, that doesn't sound like much fun. No, but it was a good education, I suppose. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Lake Akraman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire and tsunami, the giant waves formed by major Earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About 590 million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometres across and travelling at around 90,000 kilometres an hour slammed into an area of red volcanic rock about 430 kilometres northwest of Adelaide. 
Within seconds, the meteorite vaporized in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometers deep and 40 kilometers in diameter, and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100 meter height tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometers away. Ancient, stable and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Akraman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Akraman surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps 40 kilometres across, and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater, which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometres east of Akraman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Akraman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometres from Akraman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure. Coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shockwaves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then, shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Akraman, the arid, timeless Australian outback has preserved the closest thing the Earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I feel nauseous, believe me. Never had a lot of sh come easy. Had to work hard, struggle just to be me. Had to rise up just so they could see me. Did what I had to do just to feed me And what was left over I put towards my dreaming But the only thing in life that has meaning Are the things you gotta work for, believe me Take into your hands a plan Your own hands can land your own Wasting your time, let's get started So this is statement of today's essay People living in large cities have to face many problems in everyday life When people who are residing in large cities in big cities they have to face many kind of problems in their everyday day-to-day -day life. 
what are those problems the name of what are these problems should the government encourage people to move to regional towns or is it okay if government motivate people to live to the regional town mean to small towns or to village it so this is the statement and this is how i have started introduction in 2010 in india nearly 30% of the population lived in urban area nearly 30% of population in india lived in urban areas meaning lived in cities why nearly 70% of the population lived lived in rural fields 70% of the population lived in rural field mean countryside area but currently this trend is changing but now this trend is getting replaced many people are shifting or migrating from rural or urban areas to metro cities people from small cities or small town they are shifting to metro cities in big cities such as delhi mumbai kolkata and bangalore when people shift from their native place to metro cities they have to deal with a lot of problems and then they have to face lot of problems this essay will highlight the problems that human being encounter and encounter it mean face very nice verb to use when they migrate to a large city when they migrate when they shift to a large city to a big town big city and how can the authority motivate them to move to their regional places and this essay would also analyze how authority or the government should motivate them to move to their regional places or to the countryside area or the place where they are already living so this is our written main body paragraph 1 the first problem they face is no need to use comma over here no need the first problem they face is finding cheap apartment mean they it, it is not possible for people to find cheap apartment or cheap accommodation as several people are residing in large cities so the price of the house is like touching the sky mean very high price or we can say finding a flat or a house at a low price is very difficult task even the rent of the house is also very high rent of the house is so high mean people cannot afford to pay the rent even what to talk about buying a house in metro cities due to this poor people have to live in slum areas and this is the reason why poor people they have to live in slum areas mean dirty places in slum areas water sanitation and hygienic are not good hygiene are not good I mean there are lot of problems in slum areas water problem sanitation problem I mean there is no cleanliness and hygiene are not good at all due to this they develop water borne diseases and they have to face water borne diseases as well I mean many diseases because of water secondly the price of the grocery is very high price of the grocery is also very high in metro cities the third problem is the pollution in these cities is very high it can create respiratory disorders respiratory problems mean breathing problem this is how i have written main body paragraph 2 despite these problem people still continue to reside in metro cities however they have to face so many problems but still they want to reside they want to live in metro cities due to better education and employment there are two main reason one is education and second one is employment or job opportunities the governments are launching a lot of schemes to help people like urban development scheme or urban health centers government are launching a lot of schemes are launching mean they are beginning they are starting lot of schemes to help people to help people like urban development scheme these are the name of schemes or urban health centers apart from it the government can take new initiative like providing job opportunities in their regional towns moreover government can take new initiative new starting new beginning like providing job opportunities in their regional towns when I mean, government should provide job opportunities where they where they are living where they are residing I mean in small town or in countryside area the ministry should encourage mncs and entrepreneurs for creating opportunities ministry also should motivate mncs and entrepreneurs for creating opportunities 
entrepreneurs it means job uh, job opportunities or workers or em employment opportunities to recapitulate to recapitulate it means in conclusion the government should initiate infrastructure development in town so that people can live in their own town and also get employment as well as better living standard to recapitulate mean in conclusion the government should initiate mean government should start infrastructure development in towns infrastructure development in town or where they are living so that people can live in their own town so that they don't have to move to move from their own town and also get employment as well as better living standard and they can get employment opportunities side by side better living standard wherever they are so this is how it's very nice way to write your essay and you got to know how i have used all these lexical resources and uh, different kind of sentences so that you can write effective paragraph writing also uh, paragraphs and then essay as a whole this is the end of the video but don't forget to subscribe our channel like comment and please press the bell icon so that you can get notification of every new video bye bye see you in my next lesson